Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Louisa Taylor um, and uh, welcome to History Talks Live. And we've got a really, really exciting uh, talk today um, from Dr. Emily Joan Ward. Um, now, Emily's a comparative historian uh, working on Britain and Europe between the 11th and 13th centuries. And her work touches on uh, a wide range of themes, which I think will be really interesting to us today, including life cycle, gender, rulership and authority, as well as documentary culture and historical writing. After completing her PhD at the University of Cambridge in 2017, she held a research fellowship at Darwin College, Cambridge, and then became a, a British Academy postdoctoral uh, post fellow at UCL. Um, earlier this year, she um, transferred that British Academy postdoc to the University of Edinburgh, where she'll take up a lectureship in medieval Scottish history from January 2024. Uh, recent publications that um, I think will be of particular interest to a wide range of us include her first monograph, um, as well as uh, an article on diplomatic women, mothers, sons, uh, and preparation for rule in the 11th and 12th centuries, um, as well as a volume she edited with Laura Ash on conquests in 11th century England, 1016 and 1066. Um, and one thing you might also want to go and have a look at uh, is her recent appearance on Kat Jarman's Gone Medieval podcast for History Hit. Um, so um, a really interesting range of things for us all to follow up on after this talk. Um, so I'll, without further ado, I'll just hand over to Emily uh, to share her PowerPoint and, and start the talk. Thank you, Louisa, for that lovely introduction. And uh, let me just see if I can share the PowerPoint and make sure that all goes um, right. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. Getting some thumbs up. Excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. Always good to know that people can actually see. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you very much for having me uh, to talk to the uh, to the History Talks Live. It's a real pleasure to be here, um, and um, I'm looking forward to some of your questions afterwards. Um, among the collection of miracles of St. Margaret of Scotland, likely compiled in the mid-13th century, is a brief account of an adolescent boy, an adolescens in Latin, who breaks his back and loses his speech following an encounter with a demon on horseback. He is restored to full health and voice after an overnight vigil at the Well of the Blessed Margaret, probably the fountain which was incorporated within Dunfermline Abbey during the rebuilding commissioned by King David I. Uh, and I just need to check. I can actually move on my slides. Um, no, no, I cannot. Ah, that would be because I've started it on the end slide rather than the beginning slide. That's there we go. And some lovely pictures of Dunfermline Abbey and uh, the uh, stones marking the location of Margaret Shrine today. Unlike some other miracula, the story contains very little identifying information about this young man who benefited from the saint's curing power. He's not named, nor are we told the exact place of origin, although he must have come from within the immediate locality of Margaret's well, since he was carried there from his father's house within a day's travel. Recovering further biographical information about this specific youth from the surviving sources is difficult, if not impossible. Yet the description of the figure as Adelaskens three times is what particularly interests me. So this is the 14th century manuscript of St. Margaret's Miracles. And you can see the name um, or the term Adelaskens appears twice within the chapter and once within the accompanying rubric, making his age central to his identity and even more so considering the absence of other information about his background. And it's the prominence of adolescence as an identifying feature alongside other minutiae of this young man's tale, which make this miracle story so interesting to me and which I want to use this paper to explore in greater detail. Talk to you about today draws on research for my current British Academy funded project on adolescence and belonging in medieval Europe, circa 1000 to 1250. The project focuses on understanding how adolescents, especially adolescent men, contributed to and participated in groups, communities and societies between the 11th and 13th centuries. I'm especially interested in the various factors shaping young people's inclusion in or exclusion from aspects of medieval life. But I also hope to understand more about how ideas of age and belonging were themselves shifting over this period. So today I will use a snapshot of one adolescent life as recorded in St. Margaret's Miracle Collection as a starting point for commenting on some of these topics. Although young people's experiences varied widely, 
Adolescence could be an especially crucial time for fostering attachments to spaces and environments, navigating shifting social bonds and taking a more active role in group and community life. So I want to begin with the question, why adolescence? What's this word doing here? What does it mean? The anonymous Dunfermline monk who compiled and recorded the miracles performed by St. Margaret expressed his desire not to pass over the story of this certain adolescent. The author's concern to preserve the young man's testimony for posterity appears genuine, even if it was interrelated to other motivations, such as praising the saint and promoting her cult. Other writers place much less value on recording the lives of children and adolescents. And Ruth Salter has drawn attention to examples of 12th century English miracle collections, which contain minimal, if any, references to younger cure seekers. So Salter gives, as an example, Geoffrey of Burton's Life and Miracles of St. Modwenna and the Admas Miracles of St. Oswald. Even kings were not exempt from the devaluing of youthful experience within historical accounts. Writing in the early 1190s, the biographer and panegyrist of Philip II of France explained that he had decided not to write much about Philip's early deeds as king for fear of offending the ears of his listeners. So I hope I don't offend your ears today. Philip had been crowned at the age of 14 and succeeded to the throne as a 15 year old boy. And the biographer's omission is therefore revealing of a preferential focus on the events of the ruler's later adulthood. Now, Margaret's miracle collection contains several references to children, pueri, but the term adolescence features in this story alone. The text's editor, Rob Bartlett, has shown that the anonymous was a skilled Latinist, playing with rhetorical flourishes and paying close attention to his choice of vocabulary. It's worth considering, therefore, what the author may have intended by this singular use of this Latin term and its invocation of the life cycle stage of adolescentia. And throughout this paper, I'll be translating this Latin term as adolescence for ease, but it's worth pointing out this doesn't map easily onto what we might think of today as the modern concept of adolescence, and that in itself is shifting and culturally constructed, so there's not really one modern concept either. Within Latinate intellectual traditions, adolescence was perceived to be a time of growth and change, especially, although not exclusively, for adult men, uh, for, for young men, sorry, not adult men. <laughs> um, the entry into adolescentia was associated with the end of childhood, puritia. So I've put up this diagram from Thorny Abbey in the early 12th century, which is quite these themes in which um, these ideas about age are captured. So, um, so you can see up here um, the stage of adolescentia and underneath the life cycle stage of puritia, childhood. And the uh, entry into adolescentia was associated with the onset of puberty around age 14 or 15, particularly male puberty, a marker which remained relatively consistent despite different subdivisions and structures for various life cycle stages. By contrast, the end, age at which one left Mind was far more young as 21 and as late as 32 or 3. During the period this paper focuses on, Isidore of Seville's etymological overview of the human life course was one of the most widely circulating themes. Within Isidore's six part schema, which was written in the 7th century but drew on the much earlier ideas of St. Augustine, Adlescentia began at puberty, ended at age 28, and then was followed by a life cycle stage called Juventus, youth, or perhaps more accurately, maturity, because this lasted until age 50. Other writings between the 11th and 13th centuries drew on these intellectual frameworks. So simply by using the Latin term adolescens, the monastic author reflected an awareness of age-related differences in young people's experiences of infirmity and cure-seeking. Describing the young man as an adolescent also situated him socially, outside a category of childhood, but still distinguished from, and not yet entirely belonging to, full manhood. And elsewhere in the collection, we get this idea of adult manhood represented by the descriptors fear or homo, man or person. Turning to other miracula within the same collection brings into sharper focus some of the problems in identifying adolescence within contemporary sources, as well as the insufficiencies of relying on Latin terms alone. So we get a range of individuals identified and defined by their trade, carpenter, miller, monk, clerk, defined by their familial relationships, particularly son, filius, their infirmity. So as a um, describing factor, terms like blind or ill, or even their emotional state with one person called simply unhappy, miser, unhappy person. 
It would be a mistake to assume adult manhood as the default in all these instances, even if age wasn't as prominent as part of the subject's identity within the miracle stories. This makes it even more crucial to consider instances where descriptors or references to chronological age did foreground an individual's youth. What do such cases reveal about young people's participation within f families, households, peer groups, communities and society more broadly? Now, a comparison with two additional accounts of Margaret's curing powers within this collection further emphasise the potential significance of the solitary reference to adolescence. In the first story, we get a 14-year-old boy, John, who loses all movement and feeling in his limbs, as well as his capacity for speech, after being tormented by two demons in the shape of women. Across much of 13th century Europe, as I've already said, the age of 14 signified this legal and cultural marker of maturity and the cusp of male adolescence. It was the age of masculine consent to marriage in canon law. And young protagonists in vernacular romance literature often left home or were knighted at this age, even if in practice, of course, age at marriage and knighting varied quite widely. Even though the author specified John's chronological age with greater precision than the unnamed adolescent, John is still considered a child, a puer. Now this may reflect the boy's social standing, since puer was occasionally used pejoratively to imply servile status for men of all ages. However, the Dunfermline monk doesn't seem to employ the word in this way, and instead it is more likely that the familial context of John's infirmity and healing, which is responsible for leading to this identification of him as a child. His mother played a central role in his story, and the boy, we are told, lived with his parents, who were the ones who take him to Margaret's shrine. After his cure, John didn't return home, but remained in the abbatial household for several years, presumably either in service or to continue his education, although the author doesn't expand on the reason why he stayed. The second story I want to place in comparison with this concerns a married man from Clackmannan described as a youth, Juvenus, no fewer than four times within the space of five sentences. This man did not suffer from any infirmity, nor is he the one who personally benefits from Margaret's blessing. Instead, this Juvenus, this youth, was a central actor in the account of a female servant in his father's household. He had forsaken his wife and begun a sexual relationship with the servant in secret after his father's death. The young man seems to have been spared any divine punishment, but the woman develops a tumour on her head. And when St Margaret cures her, she rebukes the servant and links her suffering to the sinful role she has played in an extramarital affair. The story of the unnamed adolescent is located almost exactly midway between the account of the child John and that of the female servant and married youth. Together these three miracula provide a cross-section of shifting experiences across the earlier stages of the male life cycle. At their most basic level they are simplistic characterizations which associate childhood with parental supervision, adolescence with leaving home for work, and youth with marriage and sex. In other sources, even in other miracle collections, the words Pua, Adolescens and Juvenus were not always differentiated so markedly, with Adolescens being at times being used as synonymous with either child or youth. But the compiler of St Margaret's Miracles employed these age-related terms in a very calculated way, which highlighted interrelated facets of young people's experiences, especially in regard to place, relationships and voice. And the rest of my paper will use these as themes um, and explore how they resonate with issues of belonging during the years of adolescence, which for the purposes of this paper I'll loosely be defining as the period immediately post-puberty and extending into an individual's early to mid-twenties. So to begin then with the theme of place. One of the scant facts that the Dunfermline monk reveals about the adolescence situation is a statement that I use as the title of my paper he had been placed in the service of a knight. The young man was no longer resident with his parents, like the 14-year-old John, but nor was he yet head of his own household, as in the case of the married youth who had lost his father. Moving away from the parental home could be an important moment of early adolescence. Archaeological and anthropological studies spanning a much longer historical period have emphasised this um, crucial relationship between migration and the years of youth. And the process of leaving home has even been proclaimed as the defining feature of the transition between childhood and adolescence in late medieval England.
While the evidence from Margaret's miracle collection would appear to support such an impression, prosopographical studies have drawn attention to communities elsewhere, such as northern France or the Empire, where it was far more common for sons to be raised within the parental home well into their adolescent years. Analysis of the movement of apprentices and servants has also suggested that even when young people migrated for work, this was usually on quite a localised scale. We cannot be certain how far the adolescent cured at Margaret Shrine had to travel to join his new knightly household, but for this young man, as for many others, the work environment and familial home were never entirely disparate spaces. When the adolescent wished to return to visit his parents, he was able to do so with his lord's permission. Adolescents may have had to balance expectations and navigate new restrictions, but they could move between different environments with more fluidity than we might assume. There is perhaps a cautionary warning in this adolescence tale, since his altercation with the demon occurred outside, in a space neither lordly nor familial, when he had been taking a stroll by a little stream around sunset. The Dunfermly monk doesn't depict the young man's stroll in an especially judgmental manner, and there are other individuals throughout the collection, both women and children, who also encounter demons whilst out walking. So um, this isn't a unique facet um, solely of the adolescent story. However, it's worth thinking about the critiques commonly levelled at young people in this context, especially in conduct manuals and other moralising didactic tracts, and the idea that young people were predisposed towards idleness and levity. And this image that I've just put up on the screen comes from one of these conduct manuals from early 13th century Germany, and the association of youth uh, with gambling in particular here. Adolescents were supposed to reject such frivolity and leisure when they entered lordly service and instead focus upon learning the skills that they would require to fulfil their new roles and responsibilities. Orderic Vitalis explains how Robert of Gromesnil had to put aside both letters and leisure upon reaching the years of his adolescence in order to pursue his military training as a squire to the Norman Duke. In the case of Margaret's miracle collection, the link between adolescence and leisure is notably less prominent, so we should remain cautious about reading too much into this aspect of the tale. Elsewhere, the author clearly believed that an individual's infirmity could be perceived as a form of divine retribution for earthly sins, as is apparent from the female servant story that I told earlier on. But he doesn't make any explicit link between the adolescent's worldly actions and the onset of his infirmity, unlike within some of these conduct, conduct manuals which really um, make quite a lot of the negative tropes of adolescence. Young people did not necessarily have an active role in choosing either the timing of when they left their parental home or the location to which they moved. And the author's use here of the passive past participle positus, he was placed, suggests that in this adolescence case, responsibility for the decision making process lay elsewhere, presumably with his parents and the knight whose household he joined. Other types of sources such as vitae or romance literature were far more likely to present youthful departure for the parental home as a dynamic decision made by young people themselves. Emphasising adolescent independence appears to have become increasingly important by the mid-13th century. While this reflects the crucial role that independent decision-making could play in assertions of belonging, such accounts typically rely on stylized depictions of adolescent agency to emphasise idealised models of religious conversion or chivalric behaviour. Personal reflections on the process of leaving home are far rarer, but there are a few examples, and we get these more autobiographical passages which do emphasise the link between adolescent and movement between different environments. John of Salisbury provides one particular example in describing how he had first moved from England to France when still an adolescent for the sake of study. Even if such reflections are written later in an individual's life, they are important evidence for the different paths young people could take once they were deemed to have left childhood behind. In John's case, this led him to travel overseas, to a different realm and city, seeking out new educational opportunities. Young people's migrations or conversions took various forms, but it is undeniable that movement between different spaces and environments could be a key feature of adolescent experience. Some young men both joined and left nightly households throughout their late teens and early twenties, giving up secular positions to enter monastic communities. Aylred Rouveau, for example, was educated and raised at the Scottish Royal Court from the age of 14, but ten years later left David I's household to join the Cistercian community at Rouveau. 
Aylred's hagiographer Walter Daniel famously represented this as a sudden moment of religious conversion. But this contrasts with Aylred's own recollection later in his life of his departure from the Scottish court, amid an immoral farewell to the king. Other adolescents transferred from clerical to monastic orders, or converted from one order to another. And by the early decades of the 13th century, some young people were choosing mendicant poverty and preaching over other religious communities, or as an alternative to wealthy urban family life and marriage. Still others converted to an entirely different religion during their adolescent years, and there's been some really interesting research into the relationship between adolescent and religious conversion, uh, particularly uh, between um, within Jewish communities um, by people such as William Chester Jordan um, and others working uh, on uh, Jewish communities. The significance of joining a new community during adolescence was consistently associated with notions of identity and a developing sense of individual, group and institutional belonging. To provide one example, the chronicler of Battle Abbey, writing in 1184, explained how Odo of Canterbury feared that he would become a stranger to the Church of Canterbury, which he loved not only because it was the place where he had donned the habit of religious life, but also because it has been his community and home since adolescence. And this uh, Latin term conversatus really does convey that kind of co-meaning of uh, community and home. The years immediately post-childhood are recognised here as vital in fostering lifelong attachments, not only to the physical environment, but also to a specific social group and spiritual lifestyle, intertwining aspects of place and people. As adolescents adapted to new and unfamiliar settings, they also encountered a wider range of connections by broadening their kin networks, expanding peer groups, or even experiencing entirely new forms of social bonds. Which brings me on to my second topic of relationships. In the case of the adolescent in the miracle story, entering the knight's household would have immersed him within a much larger network of lordly connections and obligations. The Dunfermline monk doesn't specify the precise nature of the service the adolescent performed, and the word used, obsequium, can have a range of meanings from domestic service to spiritual offices. Chronicle examples most frequently link adolescence and obsequium within the context of noble and aristocratic men in a military setting. So we get an example in John of Hexham, when recording the death in the mid-1140s of an adolescent Miles, so a knight or soldier, uh, called Osbert, who was one of William Common's nephews and came from a prominent family with connections to both the Scottish and English royal households. At the time of his death, Osbert was part of the entourage of King David I's son, Earl Henry, who was then around the age of 30, although we don't actually get any reference to Osbert's specific age. Um, we probably can presume that he was younger than this um, if he's being described as, as an adolescent. The chronicler's description of Osbert as much beloved by all those in Henry's service represented the young man's positive relationships with his immediate community as basically the defining feature of his adolescence. While this suggests the value of strengthening personal ties with other members of a lordly retinue, it may have been more difficult for those in their late teens to gain recognition or assert their place within a military household in other ways. And it's telling that John's praise for older knightly individuals who died the same year as Osbert instead centred on their military and administrative skills. For example, another Miles killed at the same time as Osbert was described as a powerful and vigorous man, lauded for and defined by his physicality and strength rather than for his interpersonal relationships with others within the household. Age did not cease to be important once adolescents entered lordly retinues. Instead, their youth could continue to play a role in how they integrated and participated within these communities. William of Malmesbury explained how the English king, William Rufus, undertook nightly training during his adolescence, which included not only riding and shooting, but also competing with his elders in service, again this word obsequium, and with his contemporaries in duties or offices, officium. William of Malmesbury's comments paint a far more hierarchical picture of homosocial military environments, drawing attention to the constancy of competition and comparison with one's peers and with one's elders. Age could be a defining factor influencing these interactions, shaping how young men establish their position in relation to one another. Expectations of respect for seniority seem to have been especially prominent within clerical scholarly settings where those who did not adhere to the norms underpinning age-based hierarchies could face condemnation and even exclusion. 
And to provide one example of this, um, Peter Abelard, while still a young adolescent, so an adolescentulus, the diminutive form, attacked his teacher in disputation and then tells us in his own memoirs that this caused friction with his student peer group, his consculares. He attributed the difficulties he encountered to the fact that his peers deemed him inferior in two respects, both in age and in the length of time he had studied. For Abelard then, his adolescence, um, he perceived his adolescence to have exacerbated his comparative lack of educational experience, together reinforcing his rejection from this specific scholarly community. As young people were drawn within wider networks of overlapping social bonds, they were more likely to have to navigate the conflicting demands of different relationships. Kinship ties were especially prone to be measured against other institutional, pedagogical, religious or social connections, which sometimes resulted in conflict between adolescents and their families. Literary texts in particular often celebrated bonds of lordship over and above those of kin, drawing young protagonists into complicated webs, which revealed tensions of paternal authority, lordship, loyalty and justice. Adolescent characters frequently had to make complex moral and social choices about where they positioned themselves within these networks. And one early 13th century old French chanson de geste paints a vivid picture of a young man, Antiam, who disowns his father with the words, I do not belong to him, after discovering that the man is involved in a plot against the Lord Antiam serves. Similar messages about the prioritization of kinship alongside other relationships may also have been aimed at young people in certain monastic communities. Isabel Koshelin's work has shown how hagiographical stories about the abbots of Cluny shifted in tone from the early 12th century onwards. The hagiographies began to depict the future abbots as willful adolescents refusing to follow the path their parents had chosen for them because they knew that their true spiritual calling lay within the monastery. Koshelin suggests that the adolescent monks hearing such stories being told within their community would have felt affirmed in their decisions to follow the monastic path further convincing them that they were where they belonged. The story of the adolescent in Margaret's miracle collection suggests greater flexibility between familial and other bonds and some of the rigid dichotomies implied in other sources. The young man's request for his lord's permission to visit his parents does not seem to have been problematic, and the responsibilities of his service in a knightly household do not appear to have tarnished his familial relationships. Indeed, the author tells how the young man's arrival at his father's house brought joy to the entire household. And it was the household as an entity, the familiar, who fervently searched for the adolescents when he did not return from his walk, then carried him back to the house when they found him unable to walk, and took him to Margaret's well the following day. So the final topic I then want to turn to is this issue of voice. Much of the recent historical scholarship on childhood and youth has been motivated by a desire to recover young people's voices and place them more centrally within an understanding of past societies. This can appear to be an especially difficult task when working with medieval sources in which children and adolescents are rarely the most visible actors. However, in the story of the adolescent cured by St. Margaret, voice is a prominent theme. The young man's encounter with the demon causes him to lose his speech. Then he converses with the saint while sleeping by her well. Once he has been cured, he vocally publicises Margaret's role in restoring his ability to speak, and urges those who had brought him to the well to come with him to the saint's tomb. The author used reported speech to record both the sleeping adolescent's words to the saint, and his words to his companions after he awoke and realised he had been cured. Comparison with the earlier story of the child John is instructive once again. Although the 14-year-old boy saw a vision of Margaret and the saint spoke to him, the boy is given no words of his own in reply to her. Even after he has been cured, it is John's parents and others' presence with him who publicise the healing, rather than the boy himself. The adolescent, or the unnamed adolescent's voice, was therefore valued and centred within his story in a way which was not the case for the child John suggesting the shifting social and cultural significance of speech across the early stages of a young man's life. Adolescent voices could be a powerful tool. In the case of the young man healed at Margaret's well, his speech became a testament to the divine authority wielded by the saint, as well as a means of bringing others together to praise her. In other situations, young people's voices could play a crucial part in public performances of belonging, 
giving them an important role in reinforcing the boundaries between individuals and groups. This is the case in one manuscript of Thomas of Eccleston's History of the Coming of the Franciscans to England, which in its margins contains an account of one young man's especially de decisive vocal performance in a Northampton church. Early in the 1230s, John, the son of a knight who had provided the friars with lodgings, received the habit and attempted to enter the Franciscan order. His parents protested and were angry enough at their son's decision that they threatened to expel the friars from their land as a result. Thomas does not specify John's age, but describes him as both adolescence and puer, so using these terms synonymously, um, as I mentioned earlier on in the paper, and possibly suggesting that the boy was on the cusp of puberty because these are used interchangeably. Three decades later, at the Franciscan General Chapter in Narbonne, constitutions were issued which specified that no one should be admitted to the order of the Franciscans under the age of 18. This age limit had technically applied since the late 1220s, but it doesn't seem to have been observed consistently, and it's likely that John was under the age of 18 at this point. One of the senior Northampton brothers eventually persuaded John's parents to allow their son to decide for himself and to abide by his decision. They suggested that John should be positioned in the middle of the choir in the local church, with his parents on one side and the Franciscan community on the other. On being told to make his choice, the young man immediately ran to the side of the friars, threw his arms around the pulpit and cried out, Here I wish to stay. Whether this is an accurate record of John's direct speech is doubtful, of course, especially since the phrase volo manere appears in a significant passel in the Gospel of John when Jesus returns to his disciples and challenges Peter to follow him. Nevertheless, the story acknowledges the significance of an adolescent openly consenting to joining the mendicant life and suggests that young people's voices could be the means of reconfiguring social attachments within a public forum. John's words and actions promoted his dedication to the Franciscan order and their vision of simplicity and humility in service of Christ, a commitment which deplaced the paternal and parental obligations that had formerly dominated the young man's life, even if it did not entirely eradicate them. Greater weight may have been vested in young people's voices when used to express testaments of saintly power or decisions about their own life paths. But there is also evidence that adolescent voices were still not valued in the same ways as those of older men. Verbal correction was perceived by some to be a crucial aspect of the education of adolescents. The secular cleric Gerald of Wales, for example, um, claims uh, or cites this biblical passage from Proverbs the idea that um, he who spares the rod hates his son, but attaches this specifically to the period of childhood of Puritia, and then expands to claim that a parallel notion that he who spares his words in adolescentia hates his son. Elsewhere, Gerald sees the value of using harsh words in teaching because, according to him, docile minds should understand the teacher's purpose and accept such sternness patiently and gratefully. This shows the developmental nature of medieval pedagogical methods, distinguishing older adolescents from younger children as verbal correction replaced corporal punishment. But such ideas privileged age and the voices of senior figures, situating young people's words outside these authoritative frameworks. Literary texts likewise hint at situations in which adolescent speech was deemed unreliable at best and socially inappropriate at worst. In Jean Renard's Romance de la Rose, written in the opening decades of the 13th century, Guillaume de Dole receives a gold-sealed letter inviting him to attend the imperial court. Before leaving, he visits his mother and she asks him who he'll take with him on the journey. He decides that pleasant people are best for long journeys and explains to his mother that he'll take two companions. He mentioned by name the two he thought would do him the most credit in the hall of the emperor, for they were both valorous and well-spoken, and they were both at least 30 years old. Within this passion is an implication that younger men, especially those under the age of 30, were viewed as less suitable representatives for a lord seeking to augment his honour within a courtly setting which would require delicate social handling. The association between maturity and being well spoken suggests that the voices of younger adolescents conveyed less authority within their own communities and elsewhere. It also intimates wariness of the impulsive speech of those at a more youthful stage of life. 
Adolescent voices were, of course, not all trusted equally. My final example turns to another collection of miracle stories, which pays especially close attention to young people's speech, and in doing so sheds further light on the intersecting factors which shaped adolescent experiences of belonging. And my final example also returns to North England, south of the Kingdom of Scots, when, towards the end of the 12th century, a monk of the Benedictine Priory of Coldingham compiled 43 miracles relating to the healing power of the Virgin Saint Ebba, a 7th century abbess and member of the Northumbrian royal family. The text paid remarkable attention to the healing of the young, and the editor, again Rob Bartlett, notes that nearly half the miracle stories concern infants, children or adolescents, with a special care taken over descriptions of age and social status. Miracles concerning the restoration of speech are significantly more common, or sorry, slightly more common in this collection than in other similar compilations, but it's particularly significant that all 10 examples concerning the restoration of speech relate to young people. So we have these 10 examples and five of them uh, specifically concern adolescents and the terms used are adolescentulus, adolescentula or adolescents. And the other five examples all concern young girls referred to as puella or virgo with age divided into almost 12 and another is called around or described as around 15. Three of these young people had been unable to speak since birth while the other seven lost their speech during childhood or adolescence sometimes for a period lasting a few days or weeks in other cases for as long as 18 years. Impairments to speech could have punitive legal and vocational consequences affecting one's ability to inherit be involved in judicial proceedings or attain certain positions such implications would have been especially concerning those reaching an age of adolescence precisely when they are expected to accept greater responsibilities navigate more complex relationships and possibly even leave home losing one's speech at a young age could also alter perceptions of the life cycle's trajectory because of cultural and legal associations between rationality and adolescence speech impairments were seen to hinder the attainment of rational understanding extending the incapacities of childhood and even causing a regression to infancy which isidore of seville famously described as i've put up on my slide as the years when one was incapable of speech the compiler of this miracle collection says little about legal implications of the loss of speech, but pays far greater attention to the familial and social consequences. In the case of one adolescentula called Quinciana, who came from a very wealthy Welsh family, her infirmity doesn't seem to have inhibited her inclusion within a community of social and economic equals, nor did it prevent her from marrying and having children, like many other young women her age and status. In another instance, a Yorkshire knight and his wife interpreted the fact that all six of their children had been born unable to speak as God's penalty for their sins. The couple entered separate religious houses, leaving relatives to care for their children. When their youngest daughter was cured at Ebba's or oratory around the age of 15, she revealed that she had suffered violent mistreatment from her neighbours when she, who had tried to get her to use her voice. And in another miracle story, an adolescent boy likewise faced similar torture and torment from close acquaintances who wanted to prove that his loss of speech was mere show and deceit. Age was, of course, only one facet of young people's experiences, but it had an important role to play in ideas about social inclusion and exclusion, alongside other factors such as status, gender, wealth, family background, infirmity and impairment, place of origin and local connections. Now, adolescent experiences of social inclusion and exclusion could differ dramatically, as is clear from the comparison between the solitary adolescent in Margaret's Miracle Collection and the more numerous young people in Ebba's Miracle Stories. Yet age was not trivial to notions of belonging. The metaphor of belonging has become increasingly pro prominent over the last two decades among sociologists, cultural geographers and anthropologists. They have focused on dynamic, multiple and competing aspects of belonging, especially in the context of understanding topics such as migration, citizenship and ethnicity. Within modern youth studies, these trends have influenced to move away from the notion of youth in and as transition, simply seeing it as a stage between childhood and adulthood, because of the way in which this approach prioritises normative trajectories of progress. <laughs> 
So scholarship on modern adolescence and youth has been inspired by the understanding of belonging as something situational and constructed across the lifespan. And this scholarship has similarly stressed the importance of this relational metaphor for understanding the impact of social change on young people's lives. It's obviously not sufficient simply to impose these theories of belonging onto the central middle ages, especially when they've usually been developed in conversation with notions of modernity. But I do think that these discussions provide an important impetus for contextualising young people's roles within different historical and cultural settings. And this is particularly significant considering the work of other medievalists who have already drawn attention to the interrelationship between constructions of adolescence and youth and aspects of social inclusion or exclusion across a range of topics, so including uh, work on violence, heresy and religious conversion. Focusing on one adolescent story within a Scottish miracle collection, as I have done today, further demonstrates the importance of moving beyond a simple framework which views adolescence solely as a liminal space between childhood and adulthood. This was evidently part of the intellectual context for writers selecting specific vocabulary, especially in Latin, this desire to place adolescence as this midpoint between adult, uh, childhood and adulthood. But many of the commentators were also aware of and paid considerable attention to the relational significance of the years of adolescence, as young people moved between different spaces, navigated new and shifting relationships, and began to have their voices heard more prominently. Paying greater attention to how age intersects with other facets of individual group and institutional identity, both in Scotland and across Europe more broadly, can help inform much fuller understanding of the perceptions, actions and voices of young people within medieval society. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, an incredibly interesting paper. I, I'm now thinking of um, some examples from from my own research, from uh, Saxo Grammaticus, actually, of this use of uh, of these terms of of youth and um, of adolescence and and so on. So I think we're all probably uh, going to our own research and actually thinking about that in a slightly different way. Um, has anyone got any questions? Um, please uh, either put them in the chat or you can put your hand up um, and contribute on the microphone. Uh, while you're all thinking, I have um, uh, a question that I would like to ask, um, which is, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about status. Um, I know this sort of comes, applies a little bit more to your, to your um, sort of joins together your, your previous research and this newer research in terms of kingship. I was thinking of child kings, um, this idea of adolescence. Is there, is there a different kind of expectation of how, say, a king or an elite uh, person or a person within the church um, is expected to behave when they are are entering these different uh, this this adolescent stage. Um, do do we see some differences in terms of status there as as well? Yeah, so I think that's that's a really important question. I'm hoping that that's something that this project will help be able to sort of push a little bit further because um, adolescentia. Um, adolescence has often been seen solely as a sort of status of belonging that's only really attached to young elite men. Um, and the main focus has been looking at um, how adolescence and youth, so if we think of sort of classic articles like Georges Duby's study of the Venice in northern France, um, the classic focus has been to look at young men within a military environment. Uh, so what I'm hoping is that by comparing those sort of studies with some other areas and thinking a little bit more about whether actually um so i, th I think that's that's a cheeky way of answering your question because I'm, I'm hoping i'm gonna have a lot more to say about that in another year or so um but at the moment i mean status is very important um gender office obviously also very important um i think the examples that I've looked at so far, it's perhaps more significant sort of family setting. So it does seem to have more of an impact as to whether you're, you're perhaps particularly as a young man, whether your father has died or not. Um, and the expectation that you might have to take on certain roles and responsibilities within a household. Um, but that obviously only applies to somebody if you're to young people within their own households who actually have that responsibility. And also as we're getting sort of shifting between the 11th and 13th century as well, that's changing because you get the extension of wardship until your early 20s rather than sort of perhaps ending around the age of 14 15. Um, so you get this as a sort of chronological shift as well um, the idea that um, you actually 
potentially had somebody looking after you and your own interests and your own household until a lot later in your life as well. Um, so yeah, so yes, great question. Uh, status is very important. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what I want to say right now about exactly how important it is in comparison. I, I think I think what I'm finding at the moment is that it's very hard to pin down exactly the most important factor in many of these cases because actually the nature of the source evidence is obviously such that we're trying to put quite a lot of different things into comparison. So um, it's clearly significant, uh, but yeah. I, 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 and, you know, I think that's, that's really fascinating. I'm, I'm really um, very, very interested to, to read uh, about more about um, the, 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 some of the answers that you perhaps come up with. And I think the pro as you quite rightly say, the problem is that a lot of these sources um you know they focus on the most elite and also on those who have the greatest resources and obviously their ability to 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 do things yeah. uh, you know relies on these resources and so um a lot of the kinds of behaviors you know this ability to develop this this potential eloquence for example which is really really uh, you know, a, a really important thing uh, for, for elite men um, relies on having training, relies on education, relies on being in a household. So resources as as well become incredibly important. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, that's sort of one of the reasons I wanted to focus a little bit more on miracle stories and miracle collections alongside some of the other types of evidence I've been looking at because they are sometimes a way of at least accessing when monastic authors in particular thought it was appropriate to bring in the terms relating to adolescents in relation to people a lot lower down the social scale. So in Ebba's Miracle Collection, you get an adolescent needle seller um, who is traveling around selling needles, who's obviously quite a lot lower down the social scale than some of the young knights or members of military households that I've been talking about today. No, that, that's really, that's really fascinating. Thank you. Um, I will turn to the chat. Uh, we've got a question here. Um, based on what you've said about how medieval adolescents navigated relationships, it sounds like uh, teenage rebellion manifested not as a whole scale re rejection of authority, as it is stereotypically understood today, for example, um, but as a resolution of the contradictions between the various obligations that bound medieval men um, to their various networks, their father, teacher, Lord, God, and so on. Uh, one young man chooses his king over his family, another chooses service to God over both. Is this is this correct? Is it is this the is this what your 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 studies have found? Um, and also, uh, was adolescence the life stage at which men were most likely to find themselves uh, chafing against these interlocking hierarchies? Yeah, so again, great questions um, and ones I'm sort of still in the process of exploring. So I'll give you sort of work in progress answers, I think. Um, now, a lot of what has focused so far in the scholarship has been on focusing on seeing adolescence and youth as these times of conflict and the rejection of authority, um, as was said in the question. Um, and it's interesting that it does seem to become more prominent in the 13th century sources that we're getting in part perhaps because actually at that point we are seeing up seeing more of a widening of opportunities for people as things like towns are growing um as we're getting the development of new religious orders in particular which do seem to be actually actively seeking out young men in particular to be joining but also young women if we think about the dominicans for example um so it the focus has tended to be on these ideas of adolescent rebellion and rejection but i think as the question puts quite nicely it, it's not a wholesale rejection of authority it's very much and in these even these hagiographical texts um often represent it actually as adolescent discovery of their true path so it's less about um it's less about purely putting different relationships into conflict it's more also about adolescents finding where they are supposed to be and belong in life um and obviously these are framed often in quite um quite stereotypical ways so if we think about the hagiographical text that's usually because they're trying to be portrayed as a saint later in life so the idea of them joining a certain monastic community which was wanting to claim them for a saint becomes a lot more complicated because obviously that's where they're seen to belong because that's the purpose of the text that we have um but yeah i think a resolution of the contradictions between the various obligations that bound medieval men is a really interesting way of thinking about that um 
yeah so so thank you for that question that's actually given me quite a lot to think about and go away um and then just at the end of the question was adolescence the life stage at which men were most likely to find themselves chafing against these interlocking hierarchies i think it's definitely the point of life where men are first first likely to encounter those chafing hierarchies or at least the extension of sort of what i was saying in the paper the extension of their networks the extension of their responsibilities and the placing them within um a, a greater number of situations where they might actually be forced to make those choices so i wouldn't necessarily say it's the most likely point because i think that then is a continuing thing that they have to navigate and shift throughout the rest of their lives as well um particularly at various points we get you know it's not just young men who are making decisions to enter monastic communities for example that sometimes is a decision made a lot later in life um but i do think that that is the first point in the life cycle that you are likely to get the encounter with those competing uh, decisions. Thank you. That's really interesting. And actually, it made me think of an um, example from one of the Norwegian King sagas where um, King Sverre, and actually there's a couple of examples of this, but but the, the, the person who would become King Sverre, King of Norway um, in the uh, later 12th century, he um, he's you know, put through pr um, pre training for the priesthood when he's younger, and they uh, and later on it found. You know, the saga tells us well it was found that he didn't have these ca the characteristics required of this, and because he was put into the priesthood when he was he was young, how would he possibly know? Um, later on, it's find it's found that he has the the attributes of a king, and so as he he enters his his adulthood, he should become a king, and he can cast off the priesthood. So I think. Um, so, so that it's made me start to think actually about some of these examples in a slightly different way. I think that's very, very um, interesting. Um, I'll I'll turn to some of the quite more other questions in the um, chat. Lucy, do you want to ask a question? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, okay, right, that's fine, because it, it, it's been a bit jittery. I don't know quite why. I think it's probably the heavy snow or something. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you very much, Emily. It was fascinating. I was just so many different ideas spinning around my head. I found it hard to pin down a question, if I'm perfectly honest, because there's so many things I'd like to chat to you about. Um, but I think that um, one of the things that I was thinking about, I was when you said about the example of Philip II of France, where the the writer talks about not um, not discussing his early years because it might offend offend the ears of the reader. I thought that was fascinating, but I was thinking about the the types of authors where you know who the author is of these because I appreciate that that won't always be the case. You often know quite a lot about these authors, but where you do, do you find that it tends to be older people writing about young people? Um, or do you have examples of young people talking about themselves as young people? Yeah, that's really interesting. And this is one of the things that I'm hoping to find more examples of as I sort of go through this project. Um, so most of the time, it is usually older and older men usually talking about younger men. Um, obviously, we've got the kind of sort of semi or autobiographical passages where it's people at the end of their own life reflect on youth. However, there are some really interesting examples where it's sort of people on the cusp. So um, there's a, the, actually the image that I showed of the German conduct manual is really interesting to me because it's somebody who's possibly been connected to various different courts we're not quite sure um but he gets to he's we definitely know that he's about 30 years old and he's writing a tract in which he reflects on the behavior of children and young people within court from a very already he at 30 has very much sort of imbibed these ideas about authority and uh, what you need to do to fit in and is then regurgitating them in an, in an interesting way but um regurgitating them back for younger men in the German vernacular. So that is a really interesting example for me. And I sort of, I use that sometimes in teaching and um, and uh, end up asking, asking the students, because I'm, you know, in my early thirties. So I say to them, it's a bit like me writing a tract for you on how to behave within the classroom or, you know, um, and actually I, I, I find that quite an interesting one because it's, there's not really that much difference between the sort of 30 year old um, and the end of adolescence if we're talking about Isidora Seville's. But if you're actually talking about somebody who is sort of in their late teens versus the 30 year old person who's gone through a court environment, already been living there for sort of 10, 15 years, 
traveled around seen different uh different communities in different uh social settings i think that's a really interesting comparison so um so i'm hoping to find more examples like that where it's perhaps younger um i haven't as yet found any examples of sources explicitly written by sort of 16 17 year olds for example but some of the some of the things that are perhaps a little bit more informed at that point are when we do get those people kind of appearing in charters and things because sometimes the way that they choose to be represented particularly if the charters being drawn up within their own household and they themselves are at that more elite level um with uh, themselves have perhaps uh, taken over from their father or are still in wardship that about their representation is perhaps still coming from them so that's perhaps a, a one way of getting into it although again it's still very hard to pin down exactly how old those people might have been at the point that certain uh, certain of the documents were being issued um, but I, i'm still waiting to stumble across that letter collection written by you know an, an 18 year old reflecting on the travails of youth or something yeah <laughs> Yes, I think we're all, as medievalists, we're sort of always waiting to stumble up upon that collection of um, lost sources, aren't we? <laughs> I, th I think one of the things I've, I've also been happy to correct myself on, and I'm hoping that sort of by thinking about this and writing about this is that it might also be helpful for other people is to stop assuming that everything we're reading is written by somebody in their 40s or 50s. Because actually, when you do start thinking about it, some of the texts that we even rely on were written by people at a, actually a significantly younger age. So it's sort of going back and thinking, OK, well, when was this person writing and how old might they have been and allowing the possibility that wasn't necessarily written by somebody who was in the late 50s at the very end of a life if we can't actually be sure so, so i'm hoping i myself am sort of taking that into my own research and not assuming age um as a given thanks yeah, very much that's... that's really interesting i was just going to say i i found it there's been a couple of really interesting examples i've found of quite young people relatively speaking speaking about old age in early Ooh. modern period where yeah. they're sort of where the commentators when you actually look how old the commentators are talking about like the, oh the woe is, woes of old age <laughs> um they're actually relatively young shakespeare's yeah. a really good example of talking about old age but actually never getting there um, and <laughs> being and, bemo and bemoan and bemoaning it and that sort of thing so i think yeah i think yeah we all need to think more about that very point that you made about thinking about how old all these people were often not the age we presume i think Yeah, I think that I think that's a really important point and actually a very important thing for all of us actually to, to remember. I completely agree, Lucy. Um, I think we're we're coming towards the end of the questions, but I've got one last question that's in the chat. Um, a nice one to finish on. Is there an online source where we can all uh, read on about uh, St. Margaret's miracles in English translation? So I was using Rob Bartlett's um, edition for Oxford Medieval Texts. Now, that is not freely accessible online if you don't have institutional access. Um, if you have institutional access to the Oxford Scholarly Editions, I think it's called, um, then it is actually online and uh, fully able to see. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's not, and please somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's an easy accessible sort of website that's freely accessible to everyone with, with those miracle stories up there. I'll leave a space in case anyone wants to correct me, but I'm pretty certain it's just the one that you have to log into an institution. Mm -hmm. But hopefully for those who don't have institutional access, maybe um, if you go to a local library, they'll be helpful in perhaps helping you to find a way to access that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, and I think we'll we'll bring that to a close, even though I have a number more questions to ask, and I'm sure everyone else does. So I think we'll all be uh, frantically emailing you to ask <laughs> to ask those questions. Um, OK, so uh, thank you, everyone. Again, thank you, Emily, very much uh, for such an interesting paper. Um, virtual round of applause uh, from everyone. And uh, thank you very much uh, for coming today. I I'll, I'll just quickly um, give a little note that uh, this is the last um, History Talks Live for this uh, year. Um, so a very Merry Christmas to all of you or, or a very uh, lovely winter break, hopefully when it comes. Um, and uh, after Christmas, we will resume on Thursday, the 16th of February at 7 p.m. again, uh, when Dr. Uh, Lucy Dean, who is, is here today, 
Uh, we'll be giving a talk based on the Perth Charterhouse project, which we're all very excited about. Sounds amazing. So we're very interested to learn more about that. Um, the talk will be entitled Connections and Memories, Domus Vallis um, Virutis and the Borough of Perth. Uh, so uh, we all look forward to that. Uh, thank you very much again for coming um, and see you all next time.